valued. Amen. Amen. Um, this morning, I didn't know that, um, you know, Pastor Tim was going to pick certain songs that he picked today uh, because I had a message ready. And then last night the Lord changed and he said, you're not going to preach. You're going to share. There's a difference. I am here sharing this morning because your family we're a family. We're not uh, an organization. We're not a performance. We're not, we are family. And today the Lord wants to share his heart to you as a father because he sees us, he hears us, he knows us, and he wants to talk to us today. Amen. Amen. The songs that uh, even in first service that Pastor Tim had shared goes along with my, uh, my message. And, and the title of my message is, What's Your Story? What's your story? And some of the songs, you know, we had the lines we sang, he picked me up and he healed my heart and he placed my feet on solid ground. He changed my name. You know, I am free. I'm not the same. You've turned my life around. Amazing grace. I was lost, but now I'm found. That's a story that we get to tell. Everybody has a story. We've been reading people's stories for thousands of years. It's called in the Bible. It's, you know, we read people's biographies all the time. We're interested in knowing people. We're interested in knowing people's story. And today I want to share some stories from the Bible. I want to set a groundwork here because I know that God is going to speak to your hearts today. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you should have your Bibles in church. Or do you have your phone Bibles? You know, the U version. You can look at every version, right? Okay. As long as you read the Bible, you have the Bible. It's very important. Today, I want to mention a couple of people whose stories really intrigue me. The first one is Paul, the Apostle Paul's story. And in 2 Corinthians 11, there's a little excerpt of his story I wanted to read. I'm like, wow, this is amazing that this man went through this. This is what he says. <clears throat> I've been in prison frequently. I've been flogged severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, bandits. I've been in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Wow. What a story. This was the same man who was actually persecuting those who believed in Jesus Christ. This actually was the same man who witnessed and cheered on the murder of Stephen because he believed in Jesus. And all of a sudden, one day, this Paul has an encounter, one encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, on the road to persecute more Christians. And he has this one encounter with Jesus and it completely changes his life, which changed his story. And he said, because I am changed, now I will live my life instead of against you, Jesus. I'm going to live it for you. There's a huge difference when Jesus saves us. We're going to get into that later. But maybe many of you are like Paul. You can relate to Paul's story, to Paul's life. Maybe many of you sitting here, you used to make fun of Christians. You used to bully, bully Christians. And today you sit here in this place and you're one of us. Think about it. Wow. It's like talk about your story changing. Another one that a story in whose life really uh, intrigues me and I'm just so thankful for her life, even though she lived 2,000 years ago. I'm so thankful for this woman, Mary Magdalene. In Mark 8, it says, soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been delivered of evil spirits and diseases, and among them were Mary Magdalene. 
She also contributed from her own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Mary Magdalene was a very wealthy woman, but she was possessed, the Bible says, of seven demons. I want to stop right here because Mary Magdalene was one of Jesus's best um, financial supporters for his ministry. And she was his cheerleader. She followed him everywhere. Whatever the ministry needed, she was there. She used to be a woman that was possessed with seven demons. I want you to think about that. What was this woman's life like before her story changed? Before she encountered Jesus? Before he set her free? What do you think her life must have looked like? The torment. The torment from the demonic the harassment, the lies. Maybe she became suicidal. Maybe she was full of hatred. Maybe she was, you know, uh, an evil person because she was possessed, the Bible says, by seven demons. Demons are not nice. They're evil. They seek to destroy you. Can you imagine the type of woman she was, the life she lived, even though she was known to be a wealthy woman in society? She was possessed by seven demons, and those demons drove her life. Because once you're possessed by seven demons, not just one, what does that look like? And yet she encountered Jesus, and he freed her. And she started following him and supporting him. Maybe that's part of your story now. Maybe you're not possessed, but you sure are oppressed. Maybe you feel you have demons all around you. Maybe you feel tormented and harassed every single day. Maybe you can't sleep at night. Maybe you wake up and you just feel this dark presence in the room all the time. Maybe you have horrendous nightmares and dreams. One encounter with Jesus can free you. One encounter with Jesus and getting him into your life can change the narrative of your story. What about the woman who bled out for 12 years? Mark 5 starts at 25. And there was a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered much under many physicians. She spent all she had on doctors and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus. And when he was in town, she came up behind him in the crowd. She pushed through to touch his garment. For she said, if I will touch even his garments, I will be made well. And Jesus, mm, immediately she touched him and the flow of blood in her body dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Listen to her story. So she was bleeding out for 12 years, hemorrhaging. And she hears Jesus is in town and she's not allowed to be in where the crowds are. If you were bleeding, you were labeled unclean. You were not allowed to be part of society. And here's a crowd and she, she puts herself in the crowd and she, she's pushing through. I wonder if she was crouched down so nobody would see her. And she was so focused on Jesus. She had to get to him. She had to give, get to him that she just pushed through the crowd. She says, if I could just touch his garment, if I could just touch his garment, her faith was huge. And she said, if I could touch him, my situation is going to change. My life is going to change. And she does it. And, and Jesus feels healing power going out of him. And he stops. He's like, who touched me? He stops. He feels the faith 
tugging on him. And the faith answers. I'm telling you, faith, God responds to faith. She says, if I could just touch him, I will be made well. So he perceives a healing power goes out of him. And he's like, who touched me? And let me tell you, a lot of you have been touched. But when Jesus says, who touched me? He was calling her out. He was calling her to come out in courage, in faith, in bravery, to show herself me. I'm the woman bleeding for 12 years and I dared to come into this crowd and I dared to push through and touch the garment of the master. I dared. It's me. Do you see the consequences that she risked? She could have been thrown out of the city. She could have been stoned. Who knows? He calls her out, not to embarrass her, but to give her courage and to strengthen that faith, to seal her faith and to let others see. Do you see? She did everything she needed to do to get to the Savior. Because when you're desperate, you will do everything you need to do to get to the Savior. You will push through and you will connect and you will touch him. And when you touch him, something happens. But this is so cool. So she does. She comes out of the crowd. It says, knowing what happened to her, she comes in fear and trembling. She falls before him. I love this. And told him the whole truth. She kept nothing back. She wanted to tell him the whole truth of her story. That she can receive the whole truth about her next story. Do you understand? He says this, he gives her the truth of her next story, of her next chapter in life. He says, daughter, daughter, why is that so important? Because when you are bleeding and unclean like that, you are labeled a reject, an outcast. That's what she was known as. And here's Jesus, when he called her daughter, he repositioned her. He repositioned who she was in herself and in society and in front of everybody. He had to let everybody know she is now called daughter. No longer an outcast, no longer reject, no longer unclean. This is daughter. He repositions her. He heals her of her physical um, disease and he heals her heart. He heals her heart and he calls her daughter. Wow. I'm telling you, I could read this story over and over again and I just like, I'm there. I'm like, I wonder what she felt like. No one probably ever called her sister or friend or daughter. That's what Jesus does. He changed her story. And maybe you're here and you're battling sickness or you've battled sickness and God has healed you or you're still waiting for God to heal you. Don't give up. Press through. He wants to change your story. Amen. I read about Ruth and Naomi, who's a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law, who all, they, both Naomi lost her sons and her husband and Ruth was married to Naomi's uh, son, she lost her husband. Naomi lost all her kids. Ruth lost her husband. And they had to trust God to make a way for them in, in a, a new land. They had to trust God to start over. Uh, men in those days were the providers, the protectors, the leaders of their home. And they had no man to protect them anymore. But God, right? But God, their security was in God. And Ruth, who was a Moabite, followed her mother-in-law. And she says, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. I'm going to go. I'm going to step out in faith because you know what? I don't want to live in this chapter of my life. I want a new chapter in my life. I need a new story. I'm not going to stay here stuck. Hannah. She, she, her womb was closed and she was living with a sister wife because in those days, I don't know why they married more than one wife. I mean, you can't even handle one, you know, <laughs> I'll give him, you know, a run for his money. But this is the truth. Elkanah, he had two wives. One was um, Hannah, one was Penina and Penina was mean and she was a bully 
And she kept taunting her sister-in-law, Hannah, ha ha, you can't have kids. Ha ha, look how many kids I have. And Hannah had had it. Can you imagine that year after year after year? Listen, the reason I'm, I'm taking you into the stories, into their trauma or their pain for just a little bit is because we read the stories and, and, and nonchalantly, we just read and we say, oh, God answered Hannah's prayers. Oh, Ruth found a Boaz. Or, oh, Paul became the greatest preacher. What happened before all of that they had a story they had a story that was their life and we need to know when did God change the story because he had to have participation from all of these characters to change the story it didn't just happen they had to yield and surrender and agree with God to change their story Hannah was so fed up that she rose up from the table where they were eating it was it was the feast and she went you know into the temple and she just started crazy praying to God. Why do I say that? It's because Eli, the priest, walks in and he goes, this, this woman's drunk. Her lips are moving. I don't hear anything she's saying. She looked kind of crazy. How many of you have looked crazy praying? I have. You know, I've, I've been crazy praying where my kids would walk into the room. They go, whoa, mom's praying. Ah, it's crazy. I'm not touching that, right? Hannah just begged the Lord and she's like, I'm done. I want a son. And Eli said, okay. He said, next year at this time, you will bear a son. And she bore Samuel. And Samuel became, to this day, known as the greatest prophet of all the nation of Israel. And so God answered her prayer. And some of you may be sitting here and your womb is closed or you're having problems with children or whatnot. Give them to the Lord. See what God does. See what God does. Don't be hopeless. Don't, don't feel in despair. See what God does. Touch the hem of his garment. Release your faith and see what God does because he wants to change your story. So I see these characters Paul from persecutor to preacher, Mary Magdalene demon possessed to delivered, the woman with the issue of blood repositioned as daughter, stories of people from fearful to courageous to grieving to hope filled to depressed to joy filled. These are stories from 2000 and more years ago. Did you hear what I said? We are still listening and reading the stories of people who existed on this planet Earth more than 2,000 years ago. And we're still retelling the story and we are still impacted by the stories. And these stories still influence and help us and strengthen us and encourage us and comfort us. Isn't that amazing? Like when you read the Bible, it's amazing. It's so interesting read your bible it is so interesting it is so helpful it will change your life some of these stories have changed my life i remember when i was freshly widowed and pastor andrea you can attest to this it's like oh okay my covering's gone my husband's gone my provider my protector that kind of thing and so what do you do is lord i am going to go to the place where you call me to i'm going to still move forward i'm still going to have i'm not going to to stay stuck in this chapter this chapter is full of grief and it's depressing and it's dark and it's hopeless and people want to keep you stuck there people want to keep you in your place of despair in your dark place some of them you know they don't know what to do but some of the misery loves company they just want to keep you there they just want to keep you there I had a relative tell me who lost her husband and they were pastors and she said, it's been 10 years for me and I'm still in a dark place and you'll never get over it. And I'm like, God help me. But then I met this amazing man and I said to him, your God is my God. Your people shall be my people. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but his people have become my people and his God is my God. Do you see? I didn't, God didn't just comfort me in my chapter. Thank you, Jesus, that he did. Thank you that he did. But he wanted to write another chapter of my life. And that chapter, because I yielded to him, happened to include Pastor Spencer. So wow, right? But I could have chosen. I could have chosen. I when we were dating, when we were on the phone, 650 hours plus. Wow. Wow, he doesn't even call me today. <laughs> He's gonna throw something at me. No, don't call me. <laughs> don't call me. <laughs> but this is the thing. This is the thing. And so, you know, I was fasting and praying, and that obviously huge change, right? And I remember sitting in uh, in my church service. Stop calling me. <laughs> 
So distracting. So he was calling, uh, he was calling me. I was sitting, I, I was sitting in the service and I was just listening to the word and stuff. And, um, it, it was just a sermon about vision, about moving forward and all that. And I'm sitting at the back and I really sensed the Lord. He spoke so clearly to me. He said, if you stay here, I will bless you. But if you move and you remarry, I will bless you. It's your choice. And the reason was I just didn't want to stay in that chapter. Whatever my choice was, I was going to be blessed because I was yielded to the Lord. And I chose I will not stay stuck. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? Even if I stayed there and I did not come and I, I did not marry Pastor Spencer, I made a choice. I willed that I would not remain in that chapter. Why is that so important? Because I didn't want to keep living in my story. I wanted to live from my story. There's a big difference there. There's a big difference there. This might offend some of you, but, but some of you, you choose to live in your story, in what's happened to you, in your trauma, in your pain, in your woundedness, because it's a crutch. A crutch so that you don't have to walk on your own because it's scary, because it's unfamiliar, because you'd rather walk in the pain and trauma of the past because it's familiar to you than to walk into a future of victory because it scares you. You don't know it's on the other side. And as long as you stay where it's familiar, there's no action required of faith. I'm just going to stay here. There's a woman uh, that I wrote about this little, in the little section of my book. It's, and it just stayed with me. So there's this woman that, that I know that was in a very, very abusive relationship. Very, very abusive. She just kept running to abusive men, abusive men, abusive men. And finally, um, the Lord took her out of that. And we were able to help her on and get a job in that. And this woman was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And she thrived. And she kept getting promotion after promotion after promotion. And the bar of success was just getting higher and higher and higher. And she was just going and going and going. It's like, wow, God is just blessing her. And she reached this, this bar, this status of success. And one day she just dropped off. And she went back to her familiar lifestyle of abuse. Why? She was afraid of success. Why? Because now she was expected, held accountable to that standard of faith and living and success. And she was so afraid of what was on the other side. So instead of grabbing her faith and saying, God, let's keep going, she goes, I'm going to go back because I'm familiar. Even though it was unhealthy, it was toxic, ungodly, and dangerous. She knew what to do with it. She knew what was expected of her, and she knew what to expect, and it wasn't good. And so that familiar spirit will draw you back, will pull you back, or keep you stuck. And that's what I'm saying. You can't live in your story. You've got to pack up the tent that you pitched into that play in that place. You got to pack it up. You got to get up and you got to keep moving. Listen, the past, the pain, the trauma happened. It happened. And I'm sorry it happened. I'm sorry it happened to me, to you. To, I'm sorry it happened. But it happened. And God, even in all of his sovereignty, cannot change our past. He can't. It happened. Sin came. <laughs> we choose. Things happen. We live in this world, but God. But God, right? Your story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Where are you at? Some of you are stuck in fear and excuses. Why? Because it's hard to get up and move forward. It takes faith. It takes healing. Maybe you need to be healed. Then get up and be healed. Maybe it takes discipline. Well, then get up and become disciplined. 
Maybe it takes responsibility. Then get up and take responsibility. But do something to move forward out of that chapter. Do something so that your story can impact, influence, encourage, build, strengthen someone else. Do something. The enemy is such a liar. Listen, it takes effort and intent to move forward into the next chapter of your life. It takes effort and intent. Do not become comfortable in the familiar where no change is expected. Some of you have been struggling and wrestling with God about this. You're saying there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more to my life than this. And Jesus saved you. Praise God, right? Just that alone. Wow, are you sharing that? If you were to die today, you'd go to heaven because you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. Wow, you guys should be dancing and clapping because Jesus saved you. That is a major part of your story. If nothing else, you're saved. You're saved. And some of you are just, oh, don't put too much value in there. Are you kidding? If somebody came and put a gun to your head, boy, you're going to reach in. It's like that part of my story, I've changed. Wow, Jesus has changed that. You kill me, I'm going to heaven. But do you share that to people who are on their way to hell? Do you share that part of your story? Or do you just like to share the trauma and the woundedness? You stay stuck in the woe is me, woe is me, victim mode. Woe is me. You know why? Because that spirit likes to be stroked. As a life coach, I, I, and I, I did a lot of counseling as well before I became a life coach. This is what I said. I will never counsel a demon and I will never stroke a spirit. Get out. Right? Get out. But the enemy comes and he tempts. Why? Because it's really, really easy to feel sorry for yourself. I've been there. Have you been there? I've been there. It's easy. It's easy to fall into that because it takes effort to get out of that. It takes effort to change the narrative. It takes effort to change the story. I see, Jesse, you just wrote a book and it's your life story. And you didn't just stay in the despair, the abuse, all of that. You didn't stay there. You moved and Jesus saved you, but you moved from there too. See, you did something with your story. You didn't live in it because it felt good. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jess. You know, Jesus loves you. I know he does. You know, Jesus has a future for you. I know he does. You're doing something with your story. You're sharing it. You're sharing it. Josh that wrote, you know, that, that, that book. What's it called again, Pastor Tim? Bibles over bottles. Wow. May the Lord multiply the sale of those. May they be found in every bookstore, online, everywhere. It's everywhere, everywhere. Churches, schools, prisons, who knows where. Because the story, your story of redemption, and not just salvation, redemption, restoration, must be told. Your story counts. It's important. God had a story. God had a story for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that if you and I would believe in him, we would not perish, but come to repentance, have eternal life. For Jesus came into the world, not to condemn the world, but rather to save the world through him, right? That's God's story. Why? Because he found us in the story in Genesis. He included us in his story. He made us, but what happened? Sin came, broke relationship with God. And he says, I've got to redeem mankind. I've got to put a resolution, a solution to the story. So I'm going to send Jesus. Do you see you and I are in God's story? Is he in yours? Is he in your story? Jesus is in us. Is he coming out of us? We receive Jesus. Where is he? Do we share him? Are you pouring out the story of Jesus from your life? Where are you in your story? Are you still at the beginning where you were saved? Praise God. That's awesome. Start to share. Are you in the middle? God's doing something. I'm not too sure, but you know what? I'm growing. I'm growing. I'm loving this. I'm expanding my faith. I'm, you know, I'm reaching out to people and, and, and I'm going towards something because the end is we get to spend eternity with Jesus, but that in between, what does it look like? You know, we open our mouths to share everything else, especially gossip, don't we? Slander. Whoa, come on, come on, right? 
We can talk about everybody else, but can we talk about him? We can talk about everybody else's life. Well, they're doing this or they're going there. And I don't think that that's the will of God. And I don't think you should do that. And you're blessed. Oh my goodness. How did you get blessed? How did she get blessed? You know, what do you mean? Like he's doing that. He's starting a new business. Really? Oh, it's called moving forward. It's called vision. In Habakkuk chapter two, it says, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, write it so that when you read it, you will run with it. Though it tarries, it will surely come to pass. I'm telling you, what are we speaking? What story are we sharing? Are you so comfortable in your life? You're comfortable where you're at. You're comfortable in your sin. You're comfortable. You know, God saved me. Great. That, that's awesome. That, that's all people need to know. What's your story? If we were to rewrite the Bible today, which we're not going to, would your story end up in the Bible? Could somebody, if they were here 100 years later, 2,000 years later, would they be able to read your story and go, wow, I love that story. I love that story of Brittany. I love that story of Pastor Carla. She was an addict once. She was down. She, she got saved. But more than that, wow, all these things that she did to help those women, all those things, all the places that she went because of Jesus. Do you see, it's not just about being saved and that's the end of your story. It's the beginning of your story. It's the beginning of your story. So are you living in your story or are you moving forward into the next chapter, into the next chapter, into the next chapter? We go from glory to glory to glory. Amen? So that our life encourages, inspires, and motivates people. From the very beginning, God wrote a book for you, uniquely you. Did you know that? Did you know that we each have a book written for us in the heavens? We do. Psalm 139. When God created you in your mother's womb, it says that he, every single day of your life, he ordained it. He created He knew it beforehand before one of those days came to be but sin comes in so the plan is thwarted but God says redemption I still have the plan I wrote it down right from the very beginning he established works for you to do from the very beginning of time he's got the book for you he's got the next chapters but he needs your participation to actually manifest it, reveal it in your own, very own life. Why wouldn't you want to participate with God and say, let's keep writing my book. Let's keep writing the next chapter. My story needs to go forth. My story needs to go forth. I met with a young leader yesterday and she was telling me, I love to sit with people on a one-on-one and get to know their stories. I, I love to, I want to get to know their lives. And I said, you know what's important in that? That you share your story with them so that they can get to know your life. And trust and relationship is built. And that you can honor each other. You could strengthen each other and build each other up in the faith. Who are you sharing your story with? Who are you building up? Whose faith are you impacting? Listen, I can preach from this pulpit today, which I take very seriously. And I honor the Lord. And I can impact you very negatively. I can speak things that are very negative and try to influence you. And you will be impacted very negatively. That's the power of words. I can tell you my story and leave it in the gloom and doom. And you walk away with that and you just got half of my story. But you didn't get the full story. When you get the full story of what Christ took me out of, (laughs) where he's taking me to, that will influence you with power. I will empower you. I will encourage your heart. I will encourage your faith. He, Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He will bring it to completion if you will work with him, if you will yield with, to him, if you will say yes. Psalm 40 says this. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. He turned to me and heard my cry. He turned to me. He stopped. When Bartimaeus yelled at the corner, when when he is a blind beggar and he heard Jesus was coming into town, and he said, oh, Jesus is here. Maybe he can heal my my blind eyes. And his his friends were like, stop. He's like, Jesus, son of David. His friends are like, quiet. Don't bother the master, you blind beggar. Who do you think you are? He shook them off and he said, and and the Bible says he cried out even louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I know you can hear me. I can't see you, but I know you can hear me. 
and he shrugged his friends off. Some friends, some family members are holding you back from reaching Jesus and reaching your full potential and fulfilling your destiny. He didn't care. And Jesus stopped, just like he stopped with the woman with the issue of blood. He stopped. And he looked, he said, bring him to me. Jesus stops when you cry to him. Jesus stops when you pray and say, change my story. Move me forward. Write the next chapter of my life with you, Jesus. He stops. He says, bring him to me. And he did. And he got his eyesight back. And it said, he followed Jesus down the road. Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Faith, here it is again. Faith to step out of your comfort zone. Faith to step out of that familiar spirit. Faith to step out of what people are saying about you. Faith to step out even when you're scared. Faith to lose the crutch. Faith to move forward, to get up, to pack up the tent and say, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. It says, he lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground. He steadied me as I walked along. He steadied me as I walked along. That means sometimes when I get out of my box, when I get out of my comfort zone, when I'm walking scared, you know, my son always would tell me, mom, do it scared. Just do it. If God's calling you, he is with you. And even if I'm scared, I'm going to start walking. And as I start walking and my faith starts to be, be built, it says that he will steady me. And he steadied me as I walked along. I had to keep walking. I have to keep walking towards the new. Amen. He has given me a new song to sing. Not the same old complain, 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 woe is me. The same story you rehash over and over and over again. 25 years ago, the Lord, you know, he, he delivered me out of my addiction. 25 years ago, the Lord gave me money to pay off my car. Awesome. Great. What's he doing for you now? Because 25 years ago, that person might not have been born and you need to impact pack the next generation, right? What has he been doing for you all these years? What is your story unfolding like? He put a new song in my mouth to sing, a new song, a new hymn of praise to our God. It says, many will see what he has done and be amazed and they will put their trust in the Lord. Boy, David knew what he was talking about. I guess that his life impacted a lot of people because it says they will put their trust in the Lord. Wow. In Psalm 118, 17, I shall not die. Instead, I will live to declare the works of the Lord. I'm not going to die in my muck. I'm not going to die in my past. I'm not going to die in my pain or my trauma. That is gone in Jesus' name. For I am a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And God says, I have a new thing for you from Isaiah. Do you not perceive it? Do you not perceive it? Whatever is holding you back from moving towards God, towards the next chapter of your life, God could set you free from that. Whatever it is, whatever excuse, whatever hurt, whatever situation. Like Paul and Mary Magdalene and, and the woman and Ruth and, and Bartimaeus, your story counts too. Your life counts too. Your story is filled with God's goodness. Your story is filled with God's miracles. God took you out of the mud. God restored you. God provided for you. God stopped and he still stops and he hears you when you cry. And you say, I want to change. I need a change. I need you to strengthen me because I want to keep walking forward. I need to tell my story. What does your story sound like? What are people reading about you? What are you sharing from your story? that will give glory to God, that will bring glory to him, and that will build them up. Because your story is not just for your own sake. Mm -mm. First is to give glory to God. Second is to help love and build each other up. If you go to an apple orchard and you start picking apples from the tree, they're for you to pick. Does the apple tree pick its own apples? And if you don't pick from the apple tree, what happens to those apples after a while? They fall and they rot. Mm -hmm. If you are not allowing people to pick from you, your fruit's going to rot. It's just going to drop. You have no effect. You need to, you, you're going to stop growing. Why should I produce fruit for myself? I can't. It's not for me. It's for others to pick on. You are here today. You came through so much. You came through so much. Some of you, wow, if I were to read your story, oh, 
but you're here today. You see, you could have been dead. Some of you, the enemy has been after you a long time. Some of you watching, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning into our family worship because you count too and you are valuable. We all have a story and God can meet you right where you're at. And he hears you and he sees you and he wants to be in your story. And so when you cry out to him, he stops and he hears you. Listen, God's not done with you yet. God's not done with me yet. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, you hit 50 and a little over. <laughs> and you think, what more could I do for the Lord? You know, I've done a lot. I've been in ministry for 35 years. I've done a lot. I've traveled, seen a lot. It's been amazing. But God's not done with me yet. God is not done with me yet. And God is not done with you yet. Where are you at in your story? What story do you want to tell? What story are you telling? Do you need to change the narrative? You need to come out of your comfort zone. You need to come out of what you're familiar and just allow God to help you write the next chapter. Who doesn't want something new? Who doesn't want to move on? Is it scary? Oh, yeah. Do you sometimes want to slip back and just be, I'm just done. I don't, I don't need to do anything new. I don't need to move. Yeah, sometimes. But it's not worth it. Not for all that God has for you. It just isn't. I want to encourage you because God wants to bless you. Listen, God is for you. God was for all of these people. He was for each and every one of them. He stopped for each and every, an insignificant to the world, woman called Mary Magdalene. And Jesus delivers her. And she became one of the greatest witnesses and evangelists and cheerleader for, for the ministry of Christ. Who's little blind Bartimaeus? You mean nothing to society. And, and Jesus, the God of the universe, stops because he hears him. And he says, bring him to me. Wow. <laughs> and he asks Jesus, I call it the loaded question. He asks, Bar Jesus asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine Jesus walking into your living room? You're sitting there and he's saying, Monica, what do you want me to do for you? Oh, wow. I can't even imagine. Like, how many days do you have? My list is long. It's big. But that's what Jesus is saying today. What do you want me to do for you? What do you need me to do for you to take you from where you are to the next chapter of your life where you and I get to shine where you and I get to give hope and get to be a blessing in this lifetime listen none of us is promised tomorrow mm -mm. none of us is promised tomorrow you can go meet Jesus in the next minute our brother Al who went away you know to grad he's graduated to to heaven he didn't know but he was prepared and his life tells a story. Amen. 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 I would love all the women to stand here today. We want to honor you as mother, as woman, as daughter of God. I want you to stand. Why? Why is this? Because I want you to hold your hands out like this. Because God wants to pour in a blessing on you today. Does it mean you're physically going to feel it? Maybe. I don't know. But this is a sign to the Lord saying, you know what? I want everything you've got. I want to be blessed by you. I want to be the person, the daughter, the woman of God that you designed for me to be from the beginning of time. No matter what happened, no matter what hell I have been through, I am here today and I am receiving a blessing from you, Jesus. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Why wouldn't you want a blessing from God? Why wouldn't you? He's here today. The Bible said, do not harden your heart. This is the day of salvation. Have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And as you close your eyes, I want you to receive the blessing that the Lord has for you today. What are you crying out for? 
What are you needing God to be in your life today? What is the prayer you want answered? God is saying, I'm right here. I got you. So as our worship team sings this blessing, it's straight out of scripture, which is the word of God. Isaiah 55, 11 says that the word goes forth from his mouth and it shall not return to him void, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. And so the word of God of blessing goes over your life today and it will not return to him void. And you shall be blessed today as you yield and surrender to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord turn you. here with your wife, I want you to take your wife's hand and I want you to squeeze it and I want you to say baby, it's going to be good it's going to be all better because why? we got God in the center of our lives you are a blessed people we are a blessed people today if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior and you want to know this Jesus that stops for you <laughs> You want to know this Jesus who hears you and who sees you and who says, come, I'm here. I want you to raise your hand really high. I want to see you. I want to see you. Yes, the Lord sees you. Yes, he wants to meet you where you're at. Yes, anyone else, this Jesus loves you. He is for you and he is not against you. He loves you. And when we are praying for you, we want the prayer team to come. We want you as, as pastors praying a blessing, a prayer of blessing. And the, and the worship team will continue to, to sing that song of blessing. Whoever wants to know Jesus, I want you to meet us up front here. The prayer team will pray for you. I want you, I want you to be blessed. I want you to come and know Jesus. I want pastor to pray blessing over us. 
salvation, healing, deliverance, whatever you need, the prayer team is here for you. Do not leave this place until you have reached Jesus with your faith. He wants to meet you where you're at today. Amen. If you raise your hand for salvation, if you'll make your way right over to T there, and Mo right over there, there you go. We're going to pray with you. We want to make sure that you get your Bible. And, and if you're watching online and you want to give your heart to Jesus, you can see right there's a QR code. You can scan that. We just want to make sure that you not only know God, but you grow in your relationship with the Lord. And it never stops. It only continues. Are you ready to be blessed? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we release a blessing upon the mothers and the women in this house in Jesus' name. God, thank you for the families, for the glory of God. Lord, we release the blessing of heaven and we declare the covenant right of God upon our upon our families of this house. No weapon formed against them shall prosper. They shall increase and not decrease. They shall have joy and not mourning. That God they'll run and not walk. That Father they'll step into the new chapter and fulfill your desire for their life. And God when we see you face to face we'll just smile and say, Lord thank you. I finished the work that you gave me to do on earth and I pleased you in Jesus name and everybody receiving it said we love you ladies you all have a gift in the back pastor Lucy packed every one of them by herself we love you have an awesome week serve God with all of your hearts <laughs>